Hello, this is Pastor Patrick Hines, and we are live uh, here in today's program. I'd like to talk about uh, the precious truth of sola scriptura. Uh, what is sola scriptura, and why is it so important? Where is it taught in scripture, and uh, what does it mean? Well, if you're not familiar with the great Protestant Reformation of the uh, 16th century, um, this is probably going to be a little bit lost on you. Um, I hope that this is... Uh, live to everybody here. Um, did I make this public? I hope so. <laughs> uh, I hope it's public. Why are there not more people? There's usually a few more people. Anyway, um, what is Sola Scriptura? What does it mean? What is it all about? One of, one of the things I'd like to do before I get started is I'd like to recommend this book right here, Sola Scriptura, The Protestant Position on the Bible, which is outstanding. It's a great, great um, uh, a resource, and there's a lot of really, really good stuff in it, and there's uh, chapters by a lot of really good scholars and uh, really good theologians, including Sinclair Ferguson, Joel Beakey, Robert Godfrey, uh, James White, R.C. Sproul, um, and there's just a lot of really, really useful stuff in uh, this book, and I'll try to, let's see, I'll try to make sure a link to it gets put in the description, but I highly recommend it, and as you can see, it's not real thick. It's not a super thick book, and it's really good. It's also available on Kindle. But Sola Scriptura has to do with something that I, for, for the most part, as I've interacted with Roman Catholic apologists online, as I used to quite a bit more than I do now, I just don't have time now. I used to go out on web forms and, and talk to them. Uh, I've actually never really met a Roman Catholic who even knew what Sola Scriptura is. They always misrepresent it. So we need to describe what we're talking about when we say Sola Scriptura. The, the issue of Sola Scriptura, when we talk about Sola Scriptura, which is Latin for Scripture alone, what we're referring to when we talk about that is the number of God-breathed sources of information that the church possesses today. Sola Scriptura is addressing primarily the issue of how many sources of divine revelation are there in the church today. And I would maintain not just the Reformation, but historic Christianity has always said that there is one source of God-breathed, divinely inspired, infallible, inerrant revelation that the church possesses today. And that one source of God-breathed information is scripture. Now, the Roman Catholic Church said that there were uh, more, there was more uh, from the apostles than simply scripture. And uh, in fact, the Council of Trent, if I can uh, pull it up here, I was looking at this a little bit earlier today. Where is that quote uh, from? Here's, here's a couple other quotes that are, are real good. Yeah, John, John O'Brien, a Roman Catholic writer, says this, quote, Great as is our reverence for the Bible, reason and experience compel us to say that it alone is not a safe, a, a not a competent nor a safe guide as to what we are to believe. <laughs> now, the Council of Trent, for those of you who are not uh, familiar with that, eight, that was 18 years that they spent examining the doctrines of the Protestant Reformation. It goes um, from, I think it was uh, 1546 to um, 1564, I believe it was the last year of it. So it was eight, 18 years long. I did, obviously, they didn't meet the whole time. Uh, there were long gaps between some of those meetings, but... Uh, by the end of that council, that, that was the Roman Catholic Church's official ecclesiastical response to the Reformation. It's very important that people know what the Council of Trent is. And uh, I forgot to grab it. I don't, I don't remember if I just stepped away from my desk here, but um, do I have that over there? Uh, I still do. I don't want to. I don't want to rummage through my books on on live on a live feed here. I should have gotten my copy of the Cans and Decrees of the Council of Trent. I got a, a copy of it uh, after listening to uh, some debates between Catholics and Protestants years ago. And I read through the whole thing. And I want to tell you all, reading through the Council of Trent, reading the, the canons and decrees of the Council of Trent was one of the most important things I have ever done in my own theological development. Because it showed me uh, the way that the Roman Catholic Church kind of plays with words because they they try to talk about being saved by grace but they speak about meriting grace and they try to mix grace and works together as if god's grace makes it possible for this for us to do this that the other thing 
And it was extremely helpful to read the Council of Trent. And uh, also not only to read the Council of Trent, but also to go online for years. I, I had long debates uh, that went on for, for hundreds of pages on web forums, <laughs> arguing with Roman Catholic individuals, uh, some of them even uh, professional apologists, and looking at the way that they argue for their position. And I want to tell you, one of the reasons that I am such a vociferous opponent, and always will be, of the federal vision heresies is the way that they argue for their position is identical to the way that the Roman Catholic apologists argue for theirs. The same kinds of logical fallacies, the same misuses of scripture. Uh, it really is incredible. Again and again, I remember listening to um, Steve Schlissel, uh, his talk at the original, the 2002 Auburn Avenue Presbyterian Church uh, Pastors Conference. I'm like, is this, did they get a, a Catholic apologist from Catholic Answers to come at their, to their conference? No, 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 that's just Steve Schlissel. He argues and thinks and handles scripture exactly the same way the Council of Trent does. And exactly the same way that the, the Catholic apologists that I was interacting with at the time handled scripture. So it was extremely useful to go through the, the Council of Trent and actually see how did the Roman Catholic Church respond to the Reformation. Now, here's what... Um, the Council of Trent said, and this is from, uh, as far as what Revelation is, this is uh, the Canons and Decrees of the Council of Trent, um, uh, Section 2, uh, uh, 80. Okay, so here, here's what they said about scripture and tradition. Listen carefully to this. The Council also clearly perceives that these truths and rules are contained in the written books and in the unwritten traditions which received by the apostles themselves, the Holy Ghost dictating, have come down to us, transmitted as it were from hand to hand, following them the examples of the Orthodox Fathers. It receives and venerates with a feeling of piety and reverence all the books of the Old and New Testaments, since one God is the author of both. Also the traditions, whether they relate to faith or to morals, as having been dictated either orally by Christ or by the Holy Ghost, and preserved in the Catholic Church in unbroken succession. So Rome is saying that there is a dual source of revelation, that there are the written books and the unwritten traditions. Now, we're told that these uh, unwritten traditions have come down to us in unbroken succession uh, from the Orthodox Fathers, and that they, they received uh, both the written books and the unwritten traditions. Now, one of the unfortunate things about this is uh, we can't look at these unwritten traditions. We don't know what they are. Um, and Rome has never given an infallible list of these unwritten traditions. And uh, again and again, I have, I've pressed and asked met, dozens of Roman Catholic people and apologists, um, okay, so if you're saying that you know more than what Jesus and the apostles taught that that is inspired and necessary for us to know and believe in order to be Christians. Well, well, what are these things then? What's very interesting is James White debated Father Mitchell Pacwa long ago on the issue um, of scripture, sola scriptura. And White asked Father Pacwa, uh, who's a Jesuit, uh, that very question, uh, can you tell us a single thing that Jesus or the apostles ever said or taught that we do not have in the New Testament? And after a long pause, Paco said, no, I cannot. We have not defined anything. Um, the, the debate's over then. And uh, the thing is, many Roman Catholic apologists today know they can't defend that idea, that there that there is a fixed body of unwritten traditions that differ in doctrinal content from what we have in scripture, they know that they cannot defend that idea. And so many of them hold to what they call the material sufficiency of scripture. In other words, tradition is not really what the Council of Trent said. It's not, it's not like a separate source of revelation. They've redefined it, um, not as you know d dictated by the Holy Ghost or by Jesus, but they redefine it as, well, it's the, it's the lived understanding of the church. It's the lived understanding of scripture uh, in the church. And so then we're told that, okay, well, we believe in the material sufficiency of scripture. In other words, everything that the Roman Catholic Church believes is either is 
either explicit in scripture or it's implicitly, 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 implicitly somewhere in scripture. So eventually you do need to ask some key questions here. Where, where is the papacy taught in scripture? Um, where are we taught that Peter um, would have successors, that he's the Pope, that his popes would be the bishops of Rome, that they would have all the, the uh, powers and prerogatives of popes and be infallible when they teach from the chair and so on and so forth. Where is that implicitly, implicitly, implicitly in scripture? It's nowhere. It's nowhere. Uh, where is the idea that there's a treasury of merit uh, in scripture? Where, where is the idea that justification is a process that, that, and that um, <clears throat> it's infused into our souls through sacraments and things like, where's that taught? in scripture, implicitly or, or otherwise. Where's the idea that Mary was conceived without sin? I mean, how, how much can you really squeeze out of one verb, kakaratomene, there in Luke one twenty eight? I mean, that single word is used to defend all the Marian dogmas, her perpetual virginity, the immaculate conception, the bodily assumption, queenly coronation, I mean, all of it in, in a single word. And uh, the notion that uh, Luke when he wrote uh, Luke one twenty eight, had all that in mind is just it's just not true. He he didn't, and there's no reason to believe that. So what about things like that? Mary's immaculate conception, uh, which in its final form was put into its final form by a British monk named Edmer in the twelfth or thirteenth century, I think it was. Um, where's the idea of purgatory? I mean, all disparaging attempts to press it into First Corinthians three um, or I've heard uh, apologists from the Roman religion say, oh, it's, it's the pennies, and you won't get out of there until you've paid the last penny. So, you know, the, the details of parables are, are pressed into the service of the, these ideas. So what what is Rome's actual position on tradition? I don't know. I don't think they can really tell you. Some of them believe that tradition <clears throat> is a fixed body of doctrines that were taught by Christ and the apostles passed on outside of Scripture. Others uh, in the Roman Catholic Church that are a little bit more astute, who recognize there is no possible way you could defend that historically, hold to the, the material sufficiency of Scripture, is saying, okay, it's all there somehow. We just have to squeeze various passages hard enough to, to, to see these various doctrines and these various passages. So Rome really can't tell you what tradition is. You start pressing them. Okay, well, what, what are some things that we're supposed to believe on the basis of tradition? And you can know for sure the debate is over if their answer to that is the canon of Scripture. As if anyone in the early church thought that a church council had to define what books were in Scripture in order for them to know whether or not they were in Scripture. Uh, the early church writers, they don't seem to, to believe that. Um, because if you look at the Apostolic Church Fathers, you look at Ignatius and Polycarp and, and others, uh, they are already citing uh, from the New Testament books as thus saith the Lord. And they're already citing from Scripture as Scripture before the councils of Hippo, Carthage, and Rome ever meet. But then again, from the Roman Catholic perspective, those councils are provincial councils. They're not ecumenical councils. And so the first infallible definition of the canon of Scripture is in April of 1546 at the Council of Trent. Uh, where they actually include the Apocrypha as part of the Old Testament uh, canon, which is a whole nother issue in and of, of itself. But, okay, so the Council of Trent says that um, the, the truths and rules of the Christian faith are in written books and in the unwritten traditions received by the apostles. See, I don't, I don't know how you can read that and believe in the material sufficiency of scripture that as i said the material sufficiency of scripture perspective is that everything we're supposed to believe is in scripture somewhere and there are many roman catholic apologists that, that that's their take on this now when james white debated jerry matatix he actually asked him directly so jerry when you cite second thessalonians 2 15 hold fast to the traditions which you were taught either by word of mouth or by our epistle hmm, that, I mean, that's sounds like there's Stuff that they wrote and stuff that they taught orally. He asked him directly, are you saying that Paul taught the Thessalonians about the principle behind it, or about, about indulgences? And Matatic says, the principle behind them, yes. <clears throat> and you can hear people in the audience laughing, and, and rightly so. How could anyone seriously say that when Paul was in Thessalonica, that he taught them about indulgences or about the Marian dogmas. 
Um, I've heard some over overzealous people say things like, yeah, that's where he taught him about papal infallibility and, and things like that. I don't think Rome's best historians would even try to say that. Uh, I really don't. But the rallying cry of the Reformation was to get back to really what the early church had taught all along. Uh, the idea that there were additional truths taught by Christ and the apostles known only to some passed down through various uh, you know, bis bishops and things like that was repudiated by the early church as a Gnostic concept. Okay, And the early church understood that the only source of God-breathed truth was in Scripture. In fact, very often they use the word tradition to refer to Scripture. The, the, in, in the tradition, meaning the, the Bible, meaning the New Testament, and many uh, Catholic apologists will cite uh, references to the word tradition, not realizing that all they mean is Scripture. They're using the word tradition to refer to Scripture. But here's a couple of quotations um, that I'd like to share with you. One from Athanasius talking about scripture, and he uh, lived from 297 to 373, quote, These are the fountains of salvation, that they who thirst may be satisfied with the living words they contain, and these alone is proclaimed the doctrine of godliness. Let no man add to these, neither let him take aught from these. For concerning these, the Lord put to shame the Sadducees and said, you do err, not knowing the scriptures. And he reproved the Jews, saying, search the scriptures, for these are they that testify of me, end quote. And that's one thing Athanasius notices, the same thing that, you know, that I notice, that, that others notice when they read scripture. Jesus thought that the scriptures were clear enough for people to read them and understand them. And he held people accountable for having read them and having understood them. That doesn't mean there's no church. It doesn't mean there's no teaching authority. But it, it does mean that the scriptures are clear enough for a person who is careful, uh, who wants to understand them, to use uh, ordinary means, to, to be diligent in their study, and to make use of and to benefit from the teachers that the Lord has raised up and given to his church over the centuries. We can read the Bible. We can understand what it says. It's not uh, this muddled mess of confusion that we have to have an infallible interpreter of. I mean, I can read Ephesians 2, 8 through 10, a passage I memorized a long time ago. For by grace you have been saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, it's the gift of God, not by works, lest anyone should boast. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. It's a simple passage. It's easy to understand. Uh, we're not saved by works. We're saved unto good works. The works do not play any role in saving us whatsoever. If you know Ephesians 2, 8 through 10, you're not going to be taken in by any of the errors of your day. It's a clear, simple passage. How are we saved? By faith in Christ. Not by works, lest anyone should boast. Well, does that mean we can just live like the devil? No, we're created in Christ Jesus for good works. Not, not with the help of good works. We're not saved by good works. But that passage is beautiful, isn't it? It's so simple. It's so simple. It's nigh unto um, child's play compared to trying to wade through the Council of Trent or to read uh, Munesa Fantissimus or <clears throat> to read Pastor Eternus or Vatican I, Vatican II, these documents. I mean, Indulgentiarum Doctrina, the Apostolic Constitution on the Revision of Indulgences. <sighs> Give me Romans 8 and 9 and 10 over that mess any day of the week. I mean, are we, are we seriously being told that Indulgentiarum Doctrina brings clarity to, to what the Bible doesn't make clear? I mean, please. You've got to be kidding me. Okay, here's another quotation from Cyril of Jerusalem in his uh, catechetical lectures. This is a favorite. Uh, Roman, Rome's apologists really don't like this one. And the thing is, they'll, they'll respond to this by saying, well, Cyril believed things that you guys don't believe. As if that's relevant to the principle he enunciates here. It's not. Uh, but what else can they say? No Roman Catholic person would ever say this. What uh, Cyril of Jerusalem said to his to catechumens who were candidates for baptism. Listen, his dates are 318 to 386. Ask yourself this question. Would a Roman Catholic apologist ever say this? Whether I agree with everything else in Cyril's theology, would any Roman Catholic person ever say this? Quote, for concerning the divine and holy mysteries of the faith, not even a casual statement must be delivered without the Holy Scripture. Nor must we be drawn aside by mere plausibility and artifices of speech. Even to me who tell you these things, do not give ready assent unless you receive the proof of the things which I announce from the divine scriptures. 
For this salvation, which we believe depends not on ingenious reasoning, but on demonstration of the Holy Scriptures. Well, what about the church? Isn't there a church? Yes, and the Levites, um, prior to the coming of Christ, and then pastors and elders today, they um, are not the repositories or, or guardians of some kind of secret oral tradition. They are the teachers and the, the doormen to the Word of God. They, they uh, really, really didn't interpret the Word of God. They applied it to various situations. And that's really what I see myself as. I, I'm an expositor of Scripture and just help people to read it and to walk through it and to see what it means. And I try to benefit from those who have gone before us and to read the great theologians past and present uh, to gain from their insights. But there's no substitution uh, for just good old-fashioned roll up your sleeves and do Bible study and use Bible dictionaries and look things up and do cross-referencing and uh, do everything that the, the man of God, the woman of God is supposed to do to make sure that we handle uh, the word of God with care and, and handle it accurately and that we, we show it respect and we don't try to construct giant edifices of theology on single words like highly favored one in Luke 128. We don't do that. We also don't look at the word world or all men or whole world and say, see, Jesus died for every single human being in the whole world without distinction. He died for every single person. No, you go to the passages that address the topic. You go to John 10 and look at the whole chapter. You go to Romans chapter 8, look at the whole chapter. Uh, you go to the passages that address the subject, Isaiah 53, um, and many other places. Uh, you look at what Scripture says in its own context. Hebrews chapters 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10. Look there at what the work of Christ does and for whom it is done. Okay, that's what you do. That's what the good exegetes and the good student of God's word is supposed to do. Okay. Now, uh, I want to look at a couple other things here. Uh, um, James White's book, um, The Roman Catholic Controversy, is very good. He also wrote a book called Scripture Alone, and I, which is very good. And I, I also just want to put another plug in for this thing. Sola Scriptura, the Protestant position on the Bible. Let me pull up the camera, make sure you guys can see it. There it is. Sola Scriptura, the, uh, the Protestant position on the Bible. This is a great little paperback. It would be great to do a study of it, you know, together with people, with friends, get together and read books. That's one thing people don't do anymore. We spend too much time texting and things like that. We should uh, we should sit down and, and read books together again. People used to do that. Read the Bible together. Read the Bible out loud together. Okay, let's see. Uh, um, 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 oh. Let's see. Who else is here? Man, I don't I hardly recognize anyone here. There's Lily. Hey there. All right, Lily. So have fun in your time. You're probably just about to leave. There's Paul Garvey and Adrian Altenu. Altenu. Shalom from Israel. Wow. Uh, Brian. Okay. Let's see who else is here. And that's that. All right. So I want to talk about some things that Sola Scriptura is not. Because these are the ways that it's constantly misrepresented by, by its opponents. Number one, Sola Scriptura is not a claim that the Bible contains all knowledge. Okay, so the Bible cannot help me figure out how to build um, some uh, chairs and benches around my fire pit. Because I've, I've been looking online for some plans to do that. I can't look to the Bible. The Bible doesn't say how to do that. So it's not a claim that the Bible contains all knowledge. Sola Scriptura is not a claim that the Bible contains all religious knowledge either. Opponents of Sola Scriptura constantly misrepresented. If anyone ever quotes John 21, 25, all that shows is that they have no idea what we're talking about when we say Sola Scriptura. John 21, 25 says, and there are also many other things that Jesus did, which if they were written one by one, I suppose that even the world itself could not contain the books that would be written. Carl Keating, uh, founder of Catholic Answers, author of Catholicism and Fundamentalism, wrote this. The Bible denies that it's a complete rule of faith. John tells us that not everything concerning Christ's work is in Scripture, John 21, 25. And Paul says that much Christian teaching is to be found in the tradition that is handed down by word of mouth. 2 Timothy 2, 2. These things you have heard from me. Commit these to faithful men. The problem, of course, is Carl Keating knows he cannot tell us anything uh, that Jesus or the apostles said or taught that's not in Scripture. He knows that. Keating equates the fact that John tells us that not everything Jesus did was written down uh, with the idea that the Bible is incomplete as a rule of faith. Here's a question. Do I really need to know uh, everything that Jesus ever did? No, I don't need to know that. In fact, the, the very book he's quoting from, John's Gospel, even says in John 20, verse 30, 
Truly, Jesus did many other signs in the presence of his disciples, which are not written in this book, but these are written that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that believing you may have life in his name. The scripture itself tells us that we do not need to know everything that Jesus did in order to have life in his name. Okay, I don't need to know what they ate for dinner. I don't need to know what color Jesus' eyes were. I don't need to know um, uh, what color uh, his tunic was. or what. I, I, don't need to, I don't need to know those kinds of things. Three, Sola Scriptura is not a denial of the authority of the church to teach and preach God's truth. Opponents of Sola Scriptura often present to us uh, the fallacy of the false dilemma. Either you have to bow to some external authority. There's thousands that make these claims that Rome, Rome's claims are not unique. Uh, about authority and just check check your brain in at the door. We'll tell you everything to believe and you can have peace there. Um, but opponents of social scripture will make it into either you have to accept the particular authority of the group that we represent or it's just you by yourself with a Bible in the woods. Okay, it's either you and your Bible by yourself or you have to accept our doctrines and just check your brain in at the door and let us tell you everything. The problem with that is I as a pastor have the authority to preach, teach, shepherd, uh, and the session administers church discipline. But that authority is not infallible. It is subordinate to and derived from the authority of Scripture. And any teacher in Christ's church, worth their salt, will tell you themselves, you are not bound to believe anything I teach you unless I can demonstrate it to you from Scripture. I have no authority intrinsic. My authority is ministerial and declarative. All I can do is tell you, here's what the Scripture says. Okay, I can't tell you anything Jesus or the apostles said or taught, and the thing is, neither can Rome. They can't tell you anything Jesus said or taught or the apostles said or taught outside of the New Testament. They don't know. So the church is real. It has real authority, but it is not infallible. And I want to say that um, the Christian church has erred in the past. It errs today. It will err in the future. But I want to promise everybody, I, myself, will never make the biggest error of all, thinking I can't err. Have you ever asked yourself the question, why does the Roman Catholic Church teach what it does? Why do they believe what they do about purgatory, indulgences, and the Marian dogmas, that justification is a process of moral transformation, and the Mass, and I got a Mass card one time, someone paid money to have my soul remembered in a Mass that will be said on a certain day at a certain by a certain priest and a certain Catholic parish. Why do they do that? Because they don't believe in Sola Scriptura. Once you reject Sola Scriptura, there's no end to uh, the, the nonsense that you will believe. And it is nonsense. It is nonsense to believe things like that. <clears throat> Fourthly, Sola Scriptura is not a denial that the word of God has at times been spoken. This is something that even Rome's professional apologists clearly don't understand. Because they'll ask, did Jesus and the apostles practice Sola Scriptura? The answer is no. They lived it during a time when new scripture was being given. Sola Scriptura refers to the normative condition of the church after times of inscripturation. After times in which new scripture is being given. That's when we practice Sola Scriptura. Once the Bible is completed, now we practice Sola Scriptura. Okay. Uh, in other words, it is impossible to practice Sola Scriptura while new scripture is being given. And yes, the word of God was oral. It was orally spoken, preached, and taught. But here's the issue. Here's the main point. Were there essential truths necessary for salvation that were only preached and never written down? The answer to that question is a clear and emphatic no. There are no essential truths of the Christian faith that were only taught orally by Christ or the apostles. And if there were, and Rome knows what they are, why don't they tell us? And why do so many of her apologists believe in the material sufficiency of Scripture? Where they believe, no, 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 that there is no separate source of divine revelation called tradition. Tradition is just the lived understanding of the church uh, through the centuries. It's the, the lived interpretation of Scripture because scripture is materially sufficient, and somehow we find all of our doc doc doctrines in the text of scripture. Well, they, they're, they're apologists and theologians contradict each other big time on that, because many of them do seem to think that tradition is a fixed body of revelation 
distinct doctrinally from what's in scripture, and some of them don't think that. So here again, we're left wondering, what is this tradition that you're talking about? If you know the things that Jesus and the apostles taught that are not in scripture, uh, by all means, you know, tell us, tell us what they are. The canon, we're told. As if Paul taught the Thessalonians. Now, eventually you're going to have Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, Acts, Romans, 1st, 2nd Corinthians, Galatians. If you... Obviously not. And the early church, the early writers did not believe that they needed a council to tell them what books were in scripture. You think Augustine didn't know that Romans was in the canon? Now, immediately people bring up, well, hey, um, some of those guys believed that some of the apocryphal books were part of the Old Testament canon. That's right. They did. They did. Because there was an incredible rift between Jews and Christians early on. You see it even in the book of Acts. The, one of the main opponents of Christianity that caused so much trouble to it was the Jewish people. And because of that, there was a tremendous level of ignorance among Christians of the Jewish backgrounds. And because of that, a lot of the Greek translations of the Bible, the Septuagint versions that they had, contained the apocryphal books. And because they assumed those books were part of the Old Testament canon, they just thought that they were scripture. Okay, but they're not because the Jewish people never received those books as scripture. And the fact is, in the early church, the more that um, Christians, the Christians under uh, consideration, knew about the Old Testament, the more they knew the Jewish backgrounds, the less likely they were to um, believe that the Apocrypha was part of the canon. Okay, so be, uh, I digress. Um, so the word of God was spoken before it was written down. And people will bring this up. See, the soul scripture is not true because the word of God was preached. Soul scripture refers to the normative condition of the church after periods of inscripturation. Okay? So if you're going to say, well, they taught things in their preaching and teaching that are essential and necessary and they're not in scripture. Okay, well, what are they? And why do so many of your apologists disagree with you on that? They know there's not a fixed body of doctrines taught outside of scripture. They know that. Okay, fifthly, soul scriptura is not a denial of the role of the Holy Spirit in guiding and enlightening the church. Okay, so those are the five things soul scriptura is not. Now let's look at some things that it actually is. This uh, hopefully will be helpful to you. Soul scriptura is that scripture alone, the scriptures alone are sufficient to function as the infallible rule of faith for the church. And the key to understanding why that's the case is this. What is scripture? What is its nature? Once it's clear what scripture is, once it's clear what it is, and you're thinking, I think that you will see, there is nothing else that is identical to scripture in terms of its intrinsic properties and characteristics. Okay, because scripture has no equal in terms of authority, unless you're willing to say that the church in and of itself speaks with an absolute infallible and god breed level of authority, which is really what the Roman Catholic Church is forced to say, really in the ultimate sense, it's not scripture plus tradition plus the teaching magisterium. It's the church alone. Well, they're, they're a particular religious group alone. There are many, many groups that make that claim. But that really is their position. It's sola ecclesia. It's the, the church alone, which is why they believe what they do. That, that's why you can sit down with a Roman Catholic individual who's really committed to it and walk through Ephesians 2, 8 through 10, and they can't see it. It says not by works of saying one should boast. Yeah, that's right. The works that save us are done with the help of grace. I mean, I've had that dialogue so many times. Uh, look, Romans eleven six. Therefore, if it's by grace, it is not by works. There, Otherwise, grace is no longer grace. And they'll look right at you and say, that's right. The works that justify us and get us to heaven are done with the help of grace, not outside of grace. And it's like, you look at it again. But it says if it's by grace, it's not by works. Otherwise, grace is not grace. That's right. The works that save us are done with the help of grace. I mean, once a person has abandoned Sola Scriptura, you can't read the Bible anymore. You, you can't hear anything that it says. You can stare right in the face of passages of Scripture that refute what you're saying, that refute your theology, and you will not bow to them. Which, again, points to the need of a supernatural divine birth from on high uh, for anyone to understand and savingly embrace the gospel. Couple key passages of scripture. 2 Timothy 3:16, all scripture is Theonustos, Theopneustos, God breathed, and is profitable for doctrine, reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness. Okay, the only thing, the only thing in the N 
entire universe that has that adjective predicated to it. God breathed is scripture. The Bible is the only source of God speaking in the entire universe. I do not believe in prophetic words from God, from so-called prophets today. Um, although I've heard many such claims, uh, I would like to just point out, um, if someone has a supposedly a prophetic revelation from God, you know, in a charismatic church or whatever, if it agrees with scripture, it's useless. If it contradicts scripture, it's wrong. If it cannot be confirmed or denied from scripture, then what in the world are we supposed to do with it? How can we test it then? I'm not willing to take anyone's word for stuff like that. Plus, when you look at what the charismatics themselves say about it, they'll admit, flat out admit to you, yeah, 80% of our prophecies are wrong. 80% of the healings that we supposedly did were fake uh, or whatever. Um, I, I think probably 100% were, were fake. 80% of your prophecies turn out to be wrong. I think it was Jack Deere actually said that. Uh, I just think, hey, my uh, my football predictions are better than that. <laughs> but uh, you eventually have to ask the question, in what sense then would you say that this is a prophecy from Almighty God if it's usually wrong? Folks, there's only one thing that we can always trust and know is the voice of God, and that's the Bible. And that's why we need to be Bible readers every day, in the Word of God every day. We need to read good theology we need to listen to the good and godly teachers uh, who have devoted themselves to um, sound doctrine and the study of scripture. You know, it's interesting, you know, James White debated Trent Horn uh, recently. I have not watched that that debate. I watched the one where they, they debated, can a Christian lose their salvation? And it was, you know, it was it was, it was a very good debate. White White did a great job of, of exegeting the word of God and, and Trent Horn massacred the word of God in the, that debate because he has to because his ultimate authority is not scripture it's what the roman catholic church tells him he has to believe but i want you all to think about something if the roman catholic church really really is what it claims to be you would think they would produce the best bible teachers and expositors that we would we would listen to what they say as they walk through passages of scripture and their insights would just blow us away we would just be like wow man these people love the bible so much and uh yeah they're, they're better they're better than than protestants in the way that they exegete and handle they're so careful in the way that they handle it must be because they have an infallible interpreter that helps them that's not what happens and we all know that's not what happens when people press the the immaculate conception out of Luke 1, 28, that's not carefully handled. That's not being in subjection to the word of God. That's, you have an, an external authority outside of the Bible that's telling you what you must find there. And therefore, lo and behold, you find it. So scripture alone is God breathed. That's what we're talking about. When when, when I have gotten into the debates with, with Roman Catholic people and others, the Eastern Orthodox, Mormons, Jehovah's Witnesses, all the different authoritarian groups that are out there, it's, look, we know the Bible's God-breathed. Do you have something else that's God-breathed? For many of the Roman Catholic apologists, they would say, no, we don't. Everything is either expressly in Scripture or implicitly, implicitly somehow it's there. So they don't, most of them don't even claim to have something else that's God-breathed in Scripture. But then we're told that we're supposed to see the papacy, the priesthood, purgatory, indulgences, the Marian dogmas. We're supposed to see those in Scripture? They're not there. They simply are not there. Second Peter 1.20, another great uh, passage, says about Scripture, Prophecy never came by the will of man, man, but holy men of God spoke as they were moved by the Holy Spirit, or the term pharaoh that's used there in Greek means carried along by the, by the Holy Spirit. Holy men of God spoke. That's what prophecy is. That's what Scripture is. So the things said in 2 Timothy 3.16, all scriptures God breathed, 2 Peter 1.20, uh, the things that are said in those passages about scripture are never said about tradition or the church. Tradition is not God breathed. The church is not God breathed. The church, we're told, is the pillar and ground of the truth. That means it holds something else up. The church is a good teacher. If she opens up the word of God and walks through it phrase by phrase, does all the good, hard, spade work that a good 
minister and exegete and theologian should do to study the word of God, to handle it accurately and faithfully, and to teach and preach what it says and only what it says. That's the church doing its job. That's the church being the church. Okay, so only the Bible is God-breathed. That's why uh, it's the sole source of divine revelation. Now, William Webster, uh, who was raised Roman Catholic and came to know Christ and came out of Catholicism, was very devout uh, in his Catholicism, but he wrote a wonderful book called The Church of Rome with the Bar of History, in which he penned this paragraph. Listen, quote, In like manner, the terms sufficiency or sola scriptura sum up the overall teaching of scripture about itself. Specific scriptural descriptions of the word of God, which speak of its nature and function, lead us inescapably to this conclusion. The following are some of the words which tell us how God would have us regard his word. The word of God is, according to God himself, pure, perfect, sure, truth, eternal, forever settled in heaven. It sanctifies, causes spiritual growth. It is God-breathed. It is authoritative. It gives wisdom unto salvation. It makes the simple wise. It is living and active. It is a guide. It is a fire, a hammer, a seed, the sword of the spirit. It gives the knowledge of God. It is a lamp to our feet, a light to our path. That which produces reverence for God, it heals, makes free, illuminates, produces faith, regenerates, converts the soul, brings conviction of sin, restrains from sin, is spiritual food, is infallible, inerrant, irrevocable. It searches the heart and mind, produces life, defeats Satan, proves truth, refutes error, is holy, equips for every good work, and is the word of the living God. It is impossible to find a more convincing argument for the sufficiency of scripture than these descriptions. And no such language is ever used about tradition in the scriptures, end quote. Sounds pretty sufficient to me. Sola Scriptura is that everything one must believe to be a Christian is found in scripture and no other source. Ironically, most of Rome's apologists agree with us on that. Sola Scriptura is that which is not found in Scripture, either directly or by necessary implication, is not binding upon the Christian's conscience. Westminster Confession 1.6 says, The whole counsel of God concerning all things necessary for his own glory, man's salvation, faith, and life is either expressly set down in Scripture or by good and necessary consequence may be deduced from Scripture, unto which nothing at any time is to be added, whether by new revelations of the Spirit or traditions of men. Okay, uh, let's see. Someone just asked a question over here in the little chat thing. However, when you say that the Bible is the only infallible truth, wouldn't wouldn't that mean the interpretation? Orthodox churches pass down the interpretations, therefore you cannot use sola scriptura to correct those with a true understanding uh, as we all can interpret scripture in our own eyes. I have no idea what you're asking me. You're going to have to rephrase it. Um, in the final analysis, everyone does their own believing and their own dying. And um, I can't give that responsibility over to anybody. And the thing is, okay, let's say that the Orthodox interpretations also come down to us. Listen, Ro Robel, everything, every form of communication that you receive, no matter what form it comes in, spoken, written, gestures, facial expressions, you have to privately interpret those things. Eric Svensson uh, put out a... a uh, I think it was like a hundred thousand dollar question and asked Roman Catholic apologists, how did you come to believe and make the decision to embrace the Roman Catholic church's authority claims as the only true church on earth? How did you do that apart from private interpretation of scripture, history, and tradition? Impossible. We have to privately interpret Every form of communication that we receive. And God himself believes in the adequacy of human language to communicate truth. God believes in the adequacy of human language to communicate truth. And when our Lord Jesus was faced with error, when he was faced with error, he cites scripture. Have you not read what was spoken to you by God? And then he gives a citation. You err, not knowing the scriptures. And then he cites scripture. He, he cites the Bible. And no one ever thought to say, Jesus, we didn't know those books were in scripture. We didn't know those books. Were, you never gave us an infallible church to tell us what books were in scripture. You never, never gave us an infallible interpreter of scripture. How could we have known what any of that stuff means? 
They don't do that because scripture is clear and we can understand. To start with the teachings passed down from the apostles? No. It would be smart. Uh, well, actually, Robel, the only source of the teaching of the apostles that we have is scripture. So yeah, you're actually right. It would be smart to start at the teachings passed down from the apostles. The teachings passed down from the apostles are in the, in the Bible. And that's the only place we can find them. Now, do you, hey, Robel, do you know of any teachings from the apostles that are outside of scripture, outside the Bible, things we don't, that we don't have written down in scripture? I'm curious. Do you know of anything that's God breathed, that's inspired of God, that's outside of scripture that we need to know? I'm, I'm very curious. Uh, Rome's theologians and apologists um, actually tend to be, uh, hold to that material sufficiency of scripture view because they know that they can't defend the idea that there's an additional source of divine revelation uh, outside of scripture. And usually when you start pressing them, they'll just say the canon. And we've already been through that issue. Okay. I've been here for 45 minutes. Um, old traditions are written in, in the book of Kings, the Ethiopian Orthodox Church uses, found written in the book of Kings. If it's written in the book of Kings, you mean the book of Kings in scripture? Then it's in scripture, dude. <laughs> it doesn't make any sense. Fetha and I guess. No idea what you're talking about. Okay. Uh, Matthew 15. Um, Matthew 15, 1 through 9. Great passage. Then the scribes and Pharisees who were from Jerusalem came to Jesus saying, Why do your disciples transgress the, transgress the tradition of the elders? For they do not wash their hands when they eat bread. Now, the reason this passage is important is Jesus tells us. He shows us exactly how to deal with claims of divinely inspired tradition. Okay, the Orthodox, Ethiopian Orthodox Church is just one of a zillion groups, along with Rome and a million other, that claim divine inspiration for extra biblical stuff that they claim came from the apostles. And you know what? Jesus faced that exact thing. The Korban rule comes from Tractate Avoth in the Talmud. And uh, it violates the fifth commandment. He says in verse 3, he answered and said to them, why do you also transgress the commandment of God because of your tradition? The Korban rule. For God commanded saying, honor your father and mother, and he who, cure, who curses father and mother, let him be put to death. But you say, and they, they said this based on a claimed divinely inspired tradition passed on outside of scripture. Whoever says to his father or mother, whatever prophet you might have received from me is a gift to God, is korban, is a gift devoted to God. Then he need not honor his father and his mother. Thus you have made the commandment of God of no effect by your tradition. Now, folks, I want you to think about something. Is it, is it obvious to you that the korban rule, whatever prophet you were going to, you know, give to your parents to take care of them in their old age, is a gift devoted to God and therefore I don't need to worry about my parents. Isn't it obvious that that violates the fifth commandment? It is. It's very obvious it does. And yet, none of these scribes and Pharisees, none of them went, wow, you're right. Yeah, that does violate. That's obvious it violates the fifth commandment. They didn't care. Because once sola scriptura is abandoned, what the Bible says is irrelevant. What the Bible says is irrelevant. Okay, Robel, 2 Thessalonians 2.15 is cited by every group that makes the fallacious claim that you're making. They all cite that. Well, this refers to our tradition. Your assumption in that passage is that what he taught them orally differs in doctrinal content from what he wrote to them. And I challenge you, prove it. Prove it. Is that where he taught them? Uh, you're in North, Eastern Orthodox. Is that where he taught them about, about flying toll booths? Is that where he taught them about icons? Clearly not. But back to the back to the text of scripture. Whatever prophet you would, would have received from me is a gift to God. That's what the tradition said. And that violates the fifth commandment because now you don't have to take care of your parents anymore. Okay? Verse 7. Hypocrites, well did Isaiah prophesy about you, saying, These people draw near to me with their mouth and honor me with their lips, but their heart is far from me. Think, think about it. Why? They honored Christ, honored God only with their lips, but their hearts were somewhere else. Why? Because they didn't believe in sola scriptura. 
And because of that, they had traditions which obviously, clearly violated the commandments. They didn't care. Because once you reject and mock Sola Scriptura, you'll believe anything. You'll believe anything. You'll believe that you can have statues of God, of the Lord Jesus, Mary, and angels, and bow on your face in front of them. And we go, hey, second commandment says you shall not make for yourself a graven image, a carved image, in the form of anything in heaven above or the earth beneath. You shall not bow down to them nor serve them. Here you have images of stuff you're bowing down to them and serving them. And what do the Eastern Orthodox and Roman Catholics say? We're not violating the second commandment. Really? You have a graven image, you're bowed down. The commandment says not to do that. My ultimate authority says I'm not violating that commandment. Therefore, I'm not. And they feel totally confident about that. Pretty, pretty remarkable. <sighs> Robel, I have more proof that you, I, Ethiopian Orthodox Church, has continuity and our people were Orthodox Jews prior to Christ. I have no idea what you're trying to say. Um, you have more proof of that, uh, that you have continuity? Is that based on your uh, private interpretation of uh, history? Private and potentially erroneous interpretation of history? Yeah. Okay, we are at the 50-minute mark, um, but we're, we're told that um, tradition is to be judged by Scripture, and where it's obvious that Scripture contradicts tradition, tradition is to be rejected. And when tradition, extra-biblical tradition, is embraced as divine revelation, we have hypocrisy. We draw near to God uh, with our mouths, but our hearts are somewhere else. Okie dokie. All right, let's. Uh, I'm going to go ahead and um, and uh, knock off there. 51 minutes. Okay. Uh, thank you all for being here today, and uh, hope you all read your Bibles. I always tell people when they're from other other religious groups, go home and read Romans. Go home and read Romans every day for the next two weeks. Eight chapters a day, 16 chapters long. Get through it seven times in the next two weeks, and ask yourself the question: Did Paul teach what I've been taught about the Christian faith? Just some food for thought. Read your Bibles. The answers are right there. God bless you. Thank you all for watching or for listening.